So in this tutorial we'll build up a space scene and in doing so we'll begin to get acquainted with the uh, Nukes 3D system and some of the commonly used 3D nodes. So just to start by introducing this scene um, this is what you'll uh, this is what you'll be starting with. You can see that there's some images that have already been put in place for you. If I just open the project settings, type in S over e, type in S over here, then uh, then you can see that the uh, that the Python script has been enabled to to facilitate relative paths. Um, the scene is set to 250 frames and a frame per second of 24, and I've just set it for rendering at 1280 by 720. Okay, and um, and if we look at the images, just click on one randomly, you can see that the relative paths have already been set. Okay, and if I just bring in the the render, this is one that I rendered out while I was preparing this tutorial, and just set this going. Set it going from the start. This is really what we're aiming to achieve here. So we've got this Earth. Um, with the moon uh, orbit in it, we've got some rotation of the Earth and of the moon. We've got this uh, this kind of Milky Way background there, and we've got a starscape in the surrounding in the in the area in between the Milky Way and the uh, and the planets. Okay, so quite a lot going on. It's going to give us an opportunity to explore quite a few of the nodes. So I'll get rid of that, and we will make a start. Okay, I don't need the timeline running anymore. The first thing we're going to need to do is put a, a, a sphere into the uh, into the scene. I can go and do it the longhand way, come into the 3D menu, into the geometry, and add a sphere. And you can see there that that's uh, that's put a, a, a sphere into the scene. If I go into the 3D mode, you can actually see that uh, you can see that sphere sitting there in uh, in world space at world space zero. So it's just sat there. Okay. If I actually just click in there and type F in the viewport, that kind of frames it and that gives you a decent starting place. The first thing I'm going to do with this is put the texture on. So I've got this earth map texture. Um, and what I'm going to do is, um, is I'm just going to right click on that and I'm going to come in to the clone option. Okay, and I'm going to connect up to this, uh, to this clone. Okay, you can clone nodes in preparation for paint, pasting them anywhere in the scripts. They inherit the values of their parent, so they're, they're, they're similar to copied nodes, except that they maintain an active link with the parent values. What that means is if I come back and make changes to this, it will automatically propagate onto any of the, on a, any of the clones. So it's really helpful for maintaining consistent setups across multiple elements. For example, if you're going to be using this element multiple times, we're not going to be doing that in this, but I just wanted to introduce this as a, um, as a concept. Okay, so when we've actually done this, Nuke does two things to tell us that this is, image is a clone. I'm just going to type Alt-E just to bring that on, because this is what you will see by default the first time you make a clone. There's two things that we see. We see this little C in the top left of the, uh, of, of the node itself, C standing for clone. And we also get this connecting line between the parent and the child, which we can show and hide using Alt-E. There you go, toggling it on and off. I generally leave it off because I think that the uh, that these uh, these um, these connecting lines, similar way to the connecting lines that are created by expressions when we connect properties from one node from, to properties from another node, they uh, they kind of get in the way. And if we do need to see them, we can just quickly toggle them off to make those relationships. And I guess the thing of any significance now is that we've got this textured sphere. In our uh, in our scene, looking suspiciously like the Earth. So now we've got this. I think we can go and get our moon now. So I'm just going to bring in a sphere in a slightly different way, just by typing tab and starting to type it. There it is, and that's another way. So a quick, a slightly quicker way. Again, I'm going to right click on my moon, and um, and then I've got my texture for that. Okay, you can see that. Um, Irrespective of where we click on this, we'll see, we will see the uh, we'll, we'll see the relevant piece of geometry. Um, but um, but basically they're 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 in the same position in space at the moment, which is why we can't see them at the same time. Right, I'm just going to clear the properties panel and then double-click the sphere for the for the moon. 
so that we can uh, so that we can see this and focus on this in particular. Uh, the moon's actually around about 30 times smaller than the Earth, so I'm actually going to change the uniform scale on this to 0.3 to represent that, which is going to make it smaller. Again, if I uh, if if I if I have both both spheres connected, we're not going to see the moon now because we've got both properties open, and obviously the uh, because they're both in world space zero, and now the moon's a lot smaller than the Earth, then obviously that's never going to that's always going to be obscured now. To be able to see these in the same data stream, we have to add a scene node. And a scene node is basically this universal node which allows us to connect multiple objects to it and then connect the viewer to that. And that will allow us to see what multiple pieces of 3D from the single data stream. But again, we're not going to see the uh, the moon at the moment because it's actually stored inside inside World Space Zero, so it's being obscured completely by the Earth. So we can move it out of the way. The way that I'm going to do that, just pull all these actually, pull all these over here a little bit. The way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to add a transform node, and in the 3D world, that's called a transform geo node, which is here. Okay, just bring those up a little bit. Um, and I, I can, we do have some basic transform, uh, some transform properties within the sphere node itself, but I, I like to avoid those. I like to stick to transforms wherever I possibly can, uh, because then I can build build up complex transforms using several of these nodes, uh, and I've still got my sphere in its original state, albeit that I have made that uniform, uniform scale change. I needn't have done that even inside the sphere. I could have done that inside a transform geo. But anyway, what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to take this opportunity just to pull it out. Uh, maybe not on that axis. I think I'll actually sort of spin around so that we've got this sort of more, more uh, understandable x, y, and z axis. So I'm just going to pull it out on its x. So sort of take it out there. Maybe just pull it up a little bit as well. So let me see. Translating that by about three, and I'm just evening up these numbers in the properties panel and up in Y by 0.3. So it's out now and we can see both of the nodes um, and both of the pieces of geometry in, in situ. Okay, I'm now going to add a camera. So again, I'm just going to hit the tab and start typing it. So there's the camera. And I'm going to connect the camera to the scene as well. Okay, the, uh, the Nuke system requires that a camera is used to project any kind of 3D environment. Um, you can see the camera node properties here. Uh, we can uh, we can simulate a real camera with with these uh, with these with these properties. I'm going to start inside the projection properties, and I'm going to do a few, a few things in here. For a start, I'm going to actually change the focal length to something like 24 to give me a nice wide-angle lens. Uh, what else shall I do in here? I'll take the horizontal aperture to 36. Um, oh, I'm going to do something with the near and far clipping plane, so I'm just going to add some zeros before and aft. And what I'm doing with the clipping plane there is I'm, I'm basically telling you not to clip any geometry off, irrespective of how close or far away it is from the from the camera. And I don't really think I need to do anything else. I'll leave the f-stop as it is. I don't think I need to do anything else other than to come into the camera settings itself. Um, because at the moment, if we come in, if we if we take a look in our scene, we can't even see our camera. Uh, but if I just take the uh, the camera settings, in fact, I'll and I'll just get the Z translate, and I'll just I'll just hit five on that. Okay. So what that's done is that's brought the camera out from behind. Actually, I think I'm going to take it the other way. Leave it minus five, so it comes out the front. No, it's better off before. I think what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to actually take uh, my transform transform geo here on the um, on the moon sphere. just realized a deliberate mistake which is that I've actually put my translate values into the sphere itself so I'm actually going to take those out put the sphere back as it was and I'm going to apply those into the into the transform geo that's what I that's what I set it out to do in the first place um, and I'm just going to set that to minus three so it pokes out on the left rather than the right and then just 
pick it up a little bit in, in Y space. So I'm, I'm where I kind of want to be now. I don't, I don't want to do too much inside, inside the sphere. In fact, the 0.3 uniform scale, I'm actually going to remove that as well. And I'm going to put that in the, in the transform geo as well. So everything's, everything about the, the transformation of that to this point is actually stored within that transform geo node. So going back to our camera, we can see that by bringing it out now, it's it's in our sight, so or it's the, it has the earth in its sight, and because we've got quite a, lot, a wide focal range on it, it should also be able to see the um, should also be able to see the the moon. Um, I may need to move it at some point, and I will be animating it later. But for now, uh, let's take a look at it. We can click on here, we can come onto the camera view and hit the camera view, and we can see the frustum of the uh, of the camera. Um, based on the aspect ratio that we set and we can see that both are actually within the view of the camera now. Okay, so one further node, I'm going to apply it as a scanline renderer. The scanline renderer is a node which basically new will not render as, as in an image format anything that's in, the, in, in 3D. It has to convert it to 2D before it before it's prepared to do that, um, and the way that that's done is is using one of two nodes, a ray renderer or a scanline renderer. We'll look at scanline. We'll look at the ray renderer later, but uh, for now we'll stick to the scanline renderer. So the scanline renderer basically now allows us to see this as a 2D entity. So if I just come back to come to 2D now, we're actually looking at this in 2D space. Okay, if I if I come over to uh, to the scene node and we look in 2D, you can see we can't see anything. So what that tells us is that Newt will not show us anything that's three-dimensional in 2D view unless it goes through a scanline renderer. And once it goes through the scanline renderer, then it will show us in 2D. Okay? Cool. Scanline renderer has a few ports. The scanline renderer must connect to a camera, and the camera is the one that you want to actually present the image to the screen with. In this case I've got it connected to the scene because I'm going to be jumping between the two but uh, but at the end of the day it doesn't need to be connected to the scene in order for us to be able to see this scene in, uh, in, in as, a, as, a, as a 3D uh, object but, in, but, but rendered out in 2D. Okay so, uh, so it has that. It also has a background node uh, port and the background port is, uh, we, we would use that if we wanted to set a specific resolution uh, from our scanline renderer that was different to the actual resolution that we've set in our project settings. I don't need to do that in this particular case, but if I did, uh, then, uh, then that's, where I would set that, uh, that's where I would set that in there. I would connect to a reformat node or a constant, and I would set the resolution within that. And that would automatically mean that whatever was seen through the scanline renderer would then adopt that resolution and it would override the resolution that was set in the project settings. Okay, so let's get on to animating these spheres. We know that the both the Earth and the Moon have rotation axes. Uh, I'm going to start with the, um, with the with the Earth. So I'll clear the properties panel of what we've got and we've got our sphere here for the Earth. So for the Earth, I'm going to add a transform geo node, and this is just going to be to handle the rotation, the Earth's orbit rot, or sh yeah, the, the Earth's rotation. So the Earth rotating on its own axis, not the Earth rotating around the Sun. I think that would be a step too far within 250 frames. So I've got this transform geo here. I'm just going to make sure that I'm on the very first frame, and. If you look at the Y pointing up, I'm going to actually be spinning on that axis, so it's turning, so it's turning around this way. So on the on the Y rotation axis, I just want to right-click on that and choose Set Key. Then I'm going to jump to the final frame, and I'm going to give it a value, let's say, of 70. Okay. So if I play that now, okay. That is pretty slow. It's probably more. It's probably actually a, a true representation of, of what the Earth would look like rotating on its axis from space. Um, but bear in mind that I'm going to connect the rotation of the Moon uh, to that, and the Moon uh, ro rotates at sort of significantly slower than the Earth. Uh, then I'm actually going to artificially speed this up uh, to, uh, to kind of just for the sake of the tutorial, so that we can actually show a few things relating to connecting values. 
So this 70, I'm just going to actually multiply that up. So I'm just going to click into the field and I'm just going to times that by 5. Okay, and hit the return, and that's giving us 350. Okay, now I could have worked that out pretty simply, but I just wanted to show that these fields do allow us to put um, multiplier and divider operators into them, and a lot more more complex mathematical operators into them, and they will act on those uh, on those values. So if we play this now, we can see that that is now rotating much more quickly. Okay, artificially quickly, but that will allow us to actually sort of connect up the moon and get the moon to rotate relative to the rotation of the earth. So to do that what I'm going to do is now I've got this rotation animation in here I'm just going to click on this and I'm going to come down to copy copy animation and that's going to take the animation from that rotation of the earth there and store it in the clipboard and now I'm going to come into the transform I'm just going to actually bring this up a little bit I'm going to add another transform geo here, and this is going to handle the rotation of the moon. So I'm going to come into the rotation properties and I'm going to say paste absolute. So by doing that now, what we should see, hang on a minute, I don't seem to have done that correctly. Yep, I definitely can't do that. I definitely need to put it into here because it is going to rotate relative to its own pivot point and therefore I need to transfer that rotation on at this stage. So I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to come in now and choose paste, paste absolute and we should now see both objects rotating. But we can see that they're rotating at exactly the same speed. Okay. We know that the, um, that the moon I think it, it it takes 27 the equivalent to 27 days to do a full to do a rotation so it would expect it to be rotating much more slowly so uh, so what I'm going to do again is I'm just going to come to this end frame where we've got this 350 and I'm just going to append this by an operator of 0 0.2 which is going to take it down to 20 percent of its uh, of its original speed you can see now it's at 70 so um, so if I play that now, we can see, ooh, it's the wrong way around. I've accidentally slowed down my earth, so I'll just stop the, stop the playback and just jump to the last frame and, and undo that. Good practice is to clear the key is to clear the properties panel and then focus on the one that you want. So that's the one that I want to apply the operator to, point two, take that down to 70, and if we play it now we can see the earth's back to running at its normal speed and we can see that the moon is is moving is moving slower. So the premise there is if I is if I increase the the, uh, the if I increase the speed if I increase the speed of the um, of the Earth then the Earth moves quickly and the and it also speeds up the uh, the Moon as well because the Moon is is rotating relative to that. Okay, I'll just undo that and go back to that original. Uh, that original speed of 350. Okay, so we've got the uh, the two spheres rotating on their own axis. What I now want to do is I now want to get this moon rotating around the Earth's axis. Okay. Now I'm not going to go for a full 360 because, as I've said, it's only got 250 frames, and um, and we're not going to have it, enough time to do that. So I'm going to create the sort of the the Earth coming round, uh, the Moon coming round, and just going past the Earth. I want it to kind of come in front of the Earth because I want to show how we can use lights and shadows to actually sort of emulate how this would uh, how this would play out and how it would sort of how, how it would cast and how it would create shadows and light. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to get my moon object and add another transform geonode and I'm not going to do anything with that other than connect it to an axis. And via its axis port. 
we may and we'll see this better from the top orthographic view I think because now if I start to rotate this so again I'm just going to jump to the first frame and on the Y rotation which I believe it is again I'm going to set a key and then I'm going to come to the last frame and I'm just going to start cycling through and you can see now that that is rotating relative to the pivot point of the axis which is um, which is at world space zero. We're going to we'll see what 105 gives us when we get back into the um, in, into the camera view. So I'll just come into that and lock onto that, and we can see that coming across. You can see that coming round like so. Okay. Um, I could maybe add a little uh, rotation on the z-axis as well, maybe the other way around, just to give that a slight bit of dynamism to that. No, I definitely don't want to be up there, I definitely want to be down here. So as it comes round, it intersects and then it goes past at, the, at, at frame 250. I guess what I should point out is that this was fairly easy because as soon as I put the axis on there it's automatically set up world, plate, plate, world point zero and we know that our earth is already at world point zero but if um, if, our, if our earth was placed elsewhere uh, or indeed it was actually moving around for example moving on its own axis around the sun for example then obviously the position of the earth would move but we've seen enough now to know that we could basically parent uh, using expressions on the properties, we could uh, we could connect this axis um, and its uh, and its orientation point to this Earth, irrespective of where it was in the uh, in the, in the three-dimensional space. Okay, so I'll just jump back to the first frame, clear my properties panel, and we will look at adding some uh, some lights to this now. For this, I'm actually just going to jump into the top orthographic view, so we're kind of looking down at this, we can see our Earth, we can see our Moon, we can see our camera, and I'm just going to add a light into this scene, um, and I'm just going to use a direct light in this particular case, so I apply this, um, I'll just stretch these out a little bit so that uh, so I've got a bit more space, and I'll connect the direct light up. To the uh, to, to the scene node, okay. Um, the direct light is kind of a light that emits a parallel light just in one direction. So kind of it's going to uh, sort of appear to illuminate all objects with equal intensity. So if it was coming from a distant source, for example, the sun, which is exactly what I'm trying to do in this particular case. So this light has it, it has orientation, but it has absolutely no position in in in, in space. So all I really need to do is is rotate it. But I'm actually going to move it. It doesn't make any difference other than just get it out of this out of this central area, so it doesn't appear quite so cluttered. Okay, so I'm just going to drag it sort of out here somewhere. Uh, I'm just going to even these up at five. Like I've said, it really doesn't matter where they, where it is in terms of position. And I'm just going to rotate it uh, on the y-axis. I'll just keep scooching around there something like that I'm just going to whack up the intensity so we can actually see this when we jump into uh, in, into 3D ok so if I just turn the light on and off you can see it now you can see it quite clearly And you can see that it's actually creating sort of a night side to this. We're getting this sort of this fall off of light on the left side of both the moon and the earth. Okay, so it's okay in that respect. Okay, intensity wise, I think that's okay. I think colour wise, I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna give it a slight yellow cast. Just to sort of doesn't need to be much. Just enough to give the impression that this is a sort of a yellow light, so something like that. That's maybe too much as well. So something fairly subtle. There we go. 
something like that. So we just get the sense that this is a yellow light. Okay, so I'm just going to again shut down the properties panel so that I've uh, so it's all clear, and then I'm going to add a second direct light. And I'm going to use this slightly differently. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to use it to cast a light as if the li as if the moon is casting a light back onto Earth, because that's what would happen. The light would be quite gentle, but it would nevertheless cast quite uh, it would cast a light back uh, onto, onto the Earth. Okay. So I'm going to jump back into the top orthographic view, and I'm just going to rename these. So this one, this is the one that I created. So this is my. Uh, this is my sunlight, and this is my moonlight. Just by naming the nodes, it means that it appears there, and it's, it's much easier to actually see which one is which. Again, I'm just going to make a little bit more space in here, and again, I'm going to connect the moonlight to my scene node. And for now, I'm going to bump up the intensity just so we can see the impact of it, um, and then I'll change that uh, when we uh, I'll change that when we actually get into uh, into refining it. So I need to put this in the same position as the moon, which, as we know, can be done by linking properties from different nodes with their expressions. So. Again, I'm just going to clear this so that I'm only I only have my moonlight in the uh, in in the properties panel. And now I'm going to open the properties of this re of this transform geo node because we know that it was this tra transform geo node that actually moved the moon out into that position. So that's carrying those values. So I'm going to open that out, and we can see the trans the translate values that are that are in there. So to transfer those values onto this light. All I need to do is get the translation there, hold down control and drag from there into the same properties, the translate properties on the light. And we can see straight away that that's jumped across. Uh, so all I need to do then is just put a, a manu manually put a direction, a rotation so that it's facing the uh, facing the, the, the earth. Okay. But if I play it now, we can see that the moon moves on and the light stays put. This is the advantage of the axis because I can now hook up directly to the axis from the moonlight. The axis will now override any rotation properties that exist inside my moonlight so we will now see that both objects then rotate appropriately. So now if I jump back to my camera view we take a look at this and we can see the light going round and because our scene is at world space zero, then our, and our, uh, our light is therefore sort of to rotating to, uh, to, to look at it. At the moment, it's way too bright. Uh, I, need to turn that, I need to turn that down a huge amount. So I'll just take it down to so something like point, point 0.5. So if I just toggle it on and off, you can see it's just casting a slight light back onto the Earth. OK. I think you have to bear in mind that this is very much an iterative process. You're very much jumping backwards and forwards with colours and intensities and things like that in order to get lights exactly how you want them. Uh, and you've got a lot more things that you can do inside here, really, you know, with different types of lights. The direct light is probably the simplest, but if you're using spotlights and things like that, then you've obviously got a lot more controls that, uh, that you can play with and need to play with in order to get the lights exactly how you want them. Anyway, I'm going to move on, and we're actually going to put a image into the background. So I've got this Milky Way image here which I'm actually going to use as a backdrop for this but I'm going to do it a little bit differently to how you've seen before which is to actually put it onto a cylinder. This is actually quite common when you're building digital sets um, with, with full or partial 360 backgrounds uh, because um, and it's particularly useful for distant layers where there's no visible parallax because obviously it's just a, a single 2D 2D image. So things that are very far away, where you're not going to see any discernible parallax, this is perfect for this. But the advantage of using a cylinder is the cylinder is curved and therefore it stops you getting perspective distortion, which you would if you're using a flat object such as a planar surface like a card. 
the first thing I need to do is just temporarily select my lights and turn them off and the reason for that is when, I, when, I work, when I'm working with this um, I won't be able to see my 3D geometry uh, because, of, because of the lights. So I'm going to jump back into the top ortho, orthographic view and I'm going to add a cylinder. Okay, and you can see the cylinder appears in the scene. Um, at the moment it's quite small, it needs to be much bigger than this because it, we're using it as a backdrop so it needs to be vast. But I'll do that in a moment. Um, what I'm going to do before that is actually make a copy of this scene and this scanline renderer node. I'm going to copy those and paste them over here. And then I'm going to connect this cylinder to this scene node. Okay. So I've effectively I've got two 3D, separate 3D environments. And the reason why I'm doing that is this is going to be from a background, so I'm going to use it for the Milky Way, and I'm going to also put in a starscape. Um, and then I'm going to merge this as foreground elements over this as background elements. And to do that, I just add a merge. Remember, this is going to be the foreground element, so it needs to be A over the background elements, which need to be B. Okay, so if I jump back into that now, into, um, into a 2D environment, you can see that we don't see anything, and that's because the cylinder has got anything. But if I get my Milky Way and clone that, bring it over and connect up the Milky Way to that, you can now see that I've got that background in place. It needs a lot of work, but we've got the basis of a composite. I'll just branch that merge node out so that we've got the, an assemblance of order in this, um, in this node graph. Okay, so back to my back to my scene node and back to the orthographic view. And if we collect, connect our scene, we can uh, we've already established that this, this needs to be much bigger than much bigger than this. Uh, so I'm just gonna give it a decent value. Let's go for something like um, twenty-five. That's maybe too much. Let's go for fifteen. Okay, so if I zoom out we can see this, we can see now that this is the this is the Milky Way now relative to our planets. We can see this kind of step in. Um, that's usually an indicator that the resolution needs to be raised a little bit based on the scale that we've that we've added to it. We do that in with new, new nodes just by with rows and columns. So I'm just going to increase that to 64 by 64, and we should see that smooth out. We've got much much clearer clearer sort of uh, smoother. Uh, circle there, which is important because obviously we're projecting an image onto it and we don't want to see any visible sort of stepping uh, caused by a lack of resolution. So if I switch back to my, my 3D view, just come out of there and then go back in. A little bit tricky because we're, cut, we're obviously we're, we're moving uh, we're moving in and out of the boundaries of the um, of the cylinder itself. So I'll just lock onto the camera so I know I'm always inside the cylinder. And we can kind of see what the image looks like. If we come out of this and look at this from a slightly different view, we look at this in sort of a, what you might call your typical 2D perspective view. 3D perspective view, we can see that this image has been tiled around the entire cylinder, and of course the consequence of that is it's stretched it out beyond its, uh, beyond beyond its, uh, its sort of, it, it's changed the aspect ratio of the image and stretched it out to fill the UVs, which is uh, which is something that we don't want. So we can rein that in with the U extent of the cylinder. So to do that, we just kind of pull this in, and we can see that this starts to reconstruct the image back something like as it, as it was. So I'm somewhere around about 100 here. And you can probably just about make out that what happens when we actually get to the boundaries of the U extent, then what happens then is that Nuke is actually sort of taking the very last pixel and smearing it to fill the space. Again, it doesn't really matter because we're going to keep that out of screen, but I want to I want to hide that. So to hide that, I put a black outside node, and that will con constrain the uh, the cylinder's view just purely and simply to the area that's determined by the U extent. So now, if I come back to the cylinder and I and I start to change the U extent inside the cylinder. You can see that I can increase or reduce 
that amount of distortion in that way. I'm also going to drop the height down to one by one um, so that we're dealing with, because we haven't really got any vertical movement in our scene, we don't need it to go up particularly. Okay. The other thing to bear in mind is that um, is that when we actually, because we're actually projecting onto the inside of a cylinder, we've actually flipped our image. Um, it's not easy to, to see with this example. Let's have a look if we can see it with the Earth example. So we can see it's actually flipped the image horizontally. So the way that we would deal with that is to flop it, which would be to use a mirror node, and put that in and then horizontally flop that. It's, it's really not important for this tutorial, um, but I will I will come back to it and address it uh, later because um, because typically when you're using this kind of workflow, you might be using it for example to project a cityscape in which you've built built an image up from matte paintings of which you've got various buildings that are all, that have all got light being cast on the same faces and so on and so forth. So you can't have any sort of flipping of um, uh, of of the image in that particular sense because for a start it's it's distorting the map painting from how you intended it and it's also creating disunity between different light sources so I'll come back and, uh, and address that a little bit later. So if we jump back to our 2D view now and come out of our just connect our viewer back up to our scanline renderer then we can see what this is we can see what this is looking like we can see the effect of the mirror node there if I turn that on and off we can see the effect of that um, and what we can also do is we can also uh, we can also when we've actually put our camera move into this we're going to need to check this because obviously our camera is going to be rotating around um, inside this space and because we've got a certain area now that's hidden that's 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 hidden from view we need to make sure that that, uh, that as the camera moves we always see some part of this within the uh, within the frame so again we'll we'll need to address that uh, as we progress so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a starscape to this uh, to this scene. You can see that's our uh, that's our cylinder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a couple of spheres inside here, one smaller than the other, and I'm going to put a noise on them to kind of create a star effect. I'm creating two, one smaller than the other, in order to kind of create a sense of parallax within the effect itself. So I'll start by adding a sphere and hooking this up directly to the scene uh, that, we've that we're using for this background element. I'm treating the starscape and the, and the Milky Way as a background element and the two planets as the foreground element. So uh, what did we set our cylinder to? Set our cylinder to 15. So I can, I can realistically take this up to a uniform scale of 10 and it's going to be within the boundaries of the, uh, of the Milky Way but it's, not, but it's going to be well well outside the boundaries of the two planets. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is add a noise and connect that up. And you can see that on the on there. It's kind of creating this sort of this purling noise style sort of grungy effect. If I connect directly to this we can see what it looks like. And that's not exactly a starscape. Okay, I need to make quite a few changes t to this to make it a starscape. For a start, I need to bring the scale down, kind of somewhere, somewhere quite low to get the idea of this sort of this, these much smaller uh, sort of particle effects. Um, and also, what I need to do is I need to bring the gamma right down to create much more. Um, I'll, I'll even that out at 0 0.5, and um, and obviously that's creating much more. Um, a much better sort of uh, sort of starscape, and it's doing that because I'm basically taking the contrast out. So all the pixels that are grey, I'm, I'm either making them black or white by doing that. And I can have more or less stars and brighten up the stars by increasing the gain. I'll take that up to 0.5. Okay. So we've got a starscape there now, which if I connect up to my scanline renderer, we come in a little bit, and I toggle that on and off. We can see that, and we can see all sorts that's not right about this. We can see that these stars are currently 
way too big and way too blurry. That's a resolution issue. And the reason is, is basically because these are coming into this scanline renderer, and this scanline renderer is assuming the resolution of the of the entire project, which was set to 1280 by 720. You almost never want to uh, never want to stick to that when you're actually creating noise effects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the resolution of this noise effect by adding a reformat node. And I've already got an 8K, uh, an 8K uh, resolution, but you, you won't have one. I've created that when I was preparing this tutorial. So um, I'm just going to show what you would do in that particular case. You choose a new format. Um, you would give it a name, Fred, for example. You'd give it a an aspect ratio, so 10,000 by 10,000. OK. And now the resolution is much different, so again, if I turn that reformat off, you can see that's back as we were with these big blurry stars. And we turn that back on now, and these stars are much more as we'd expect them expect them to be in the scene. And you can see there when I toggle that on and off, you can see them in the in the 2D environment. Okay. So all I would need to do now is make a copy of those two nodes, and then these into the scene and then this this other sphere again if I come back to my top view um, I'm just going to bring this down in scale down to say something like six so if we look at the scene now we've got the uh, we've got our outer cylinder we've got our outer cylinder we've got our inner outer outer sphere of, of, of noise effects and we've got our inner sphere of noise effects and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, add a bit of random rotation to this inner sphere just so that the patterns don't don't uh, match up as being sort of uniform between the two spheres so I'm just going to give this just some random numbers so all I've done is I've just rotated this inner sphere just so that it looks different to the uh, to, to the outer sphere so the patterns don't uh, don't look like uh, like they like they're repeating so again, if I just connect my viewer back to the scanline renderer and jump back into 2D view, you can see the inner, the inner stars there. See the outer stars there, and obviously our cylinder there with the Milky Way on it. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create. An animation. So I'm going to be moving my camera within this scene just to give a bit of dynamism and also to exploit the parallax that now exists between all these 3D elements. Okay, so again I'm going to come into my top view. I tend to use this quite a lot. I just want to click away so that I don't see. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of those objects and just type D just to disable them for now so that I can just see this area because this is where I obviously want to focus my camera. I'm just going to jump to the first frame and I'm going to set a key. So I'm just going to clear out my properties and then select the camera so I know what I'm working with. And, um, and I'm going to do translation and rotation. So I'm going to set a key on the translate and set a key on the rotate. Then I'm going to jump to the end frame and I'm going to shift the camera. So let's move it, say for example, across here something like that and then just spin it around to something something where we again where we see both spheres within the within the range um, let's go with I'll just even these up for now I'll need to go I'll need to check these out in 2d in, in a second but what you should see now is you should see that that motion path taking place it's definitely not right. That definitely needs to go more, more in that direction, and probably go in a little bit. So let me just try 2.5, and that's near enough to 4. Um, I don't know why I do that with values. It's really anal. But anyway, what we can see there is a really unimaginative motion path there, just a straight move with a with a little bit of a rotate. But it should prove the concept 
of, uh, of what we're trying to achieve in terms of seeing the parallax from our 3D objects. So I'll just jump into 2D view and now I'll suss, these, uh, I'll suss this out. So this is our starting position. This is, uh, this is as the camera moves around and uh, we don't see our we don't see our our moon beyond that point, and I think that's uh, I think that's easily redeemable. I think what we can do there is we can get our we can get our our moon animation. Um, no, we did it there in the axis, um, and I can just start to pull that back in in numbers. And what I'm doing is I'm pulling it back along its motion path, so it should start to come into view in a second and get it to somewhere like somewhere around about there so we see it the camera moves we're not we're not seeing it in the context of these objects yet it would probably be better if we did at this stage so I'll just re-enable those um, and let's take a look at it let's, I'll just put it into proxy view so it, so it previews more quickly so the camera is moving hopefully it's moving doesn't look like it's moving. Let me look at it in 3D view. Okay, it definitely is moving. I'm just not seeing the movement of the um, of the the Milky Way relative to this. Ah, oh, there's the reason why. It's because our second scanline renderer is not connected to the camera. So now it is. So we should now see that moving around. And we should see the problem there that I was speaking about at the beginning, which is, if we look at this in the 3D view, we can see that as our camera comes around, then what's happening is it's obviously its range is exceeding the boundaries of the of the cylinder so we're going to need to deal with the cylinder to finish this tutorial and this always involves a combination of different uh, of different approaches so we can see it's fine there so what I'm going to do is jump to the last frame just to see the range and um, so we're losing about half of it there the border we can actually sort of take that up and we can see it a little bit more clearly and we can also see that we've got some height issues as well so we're going to need to increase the height of this as well but I'll start with the width so we're going to get the cylinder um, and I'm going to do this in a, in a few different ways I'm, I'm going to start by just trying to scale it up a little bit maybe just take it up to 20 which will get us part way along and now just take out take up the new extent a little bit. Let me just take it to 150 and we'll see where we are. we are at that point. Now we're not all the way, but by increasing the U extent, what we've done is we've increased the range around both sides. So we should now have some um, we should now have some surplus at the uh, at the front of the shop. So if we go back to frame one, we've got some surplus over here now because we've increased the U extent. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start to rotate the cylinder on its Y axis. You can see that I've got quite a lot at that end. So I'm just taking, going as far as I can before I run out. You can see there I run out. So just jump in a little bit from that point. Now jump to the last frame and I'm almost there. I just need to take it up, take it either take it a little bit more, or maybe I can just change these rotation steps rather than jumping in tens to um, to just jumping in single integers Come right to the end. There we go. That's the end. So there, I've got coverage at frame one. And there, I've got coverage at frame two hundred and fifty. So it it took combination of two or three different strategies to resolve that so just go over those again 
So obviously by increasing the uniform scale and making it bigger and therefore its footprint is, uh, is greater from the perspective of the camera. So that's one, uh, that's one way that we could deal with it. Another way that we can deal with it is by increasing the U extent which obviously stretches out the, uh, the pattern of, of image that's available and obviously with that comes a stretching of the image itself so the the, the width is, 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 is stretched relative to the height and that's something I might want to just correct at this stage and just maybe add a little bit of extra height just to try and sort of offset any lens distortion that's been caused by stretching out the cylinder and then the other thing was the rotation because obviously when I increase the U extent I'm increasing the, the, the reach on both sides which meant that I'd got some um, I'd got some excess at the beginning of the first clip to the left of the, to the left of the frame on the first clip which I could just rotate around and so those three approaches that I used uh, got me to this uh, got me to this place okay so very last thing I'm going to do is just a little bit of color correction I'm just going to come into my Milky Way and just put a grade node in here and I'm just going to use this to um, to add in a, a little bit of, of blue tonality and try and bring it back to try and bring it back to the sort of the scene. So I'm going to do that in the in the gamma and also in the gain. It's too far. Maybe just add a little bit of magenta in the gain. Okay, and I'll do something similar on the earth. But before I do this, I'm going to turn on my lights because they are going to have bearing on how this looks. So I just need to re-enable those. Uh, and I can see that I need to make some colour improvements here. So again, I'm just going to bring the cyan and the blues up in the gain and also in the gamma. see it. Uh, that's uh, losing a bit of contrast there so I'll just bring that back. Okay. And I just need to come back to that that background and take a little bit of that a um, little bit of that magenta out. I think it's getting a little bit oppressive. Okay. Let's say that um, let's say that that's that's enough. I'm happy with that. So the last step would be to uh, would be to write this out. I'll just come forward in, in time here. Just bring the to bring the moon into view, and then past and through some nice shadow in there as it goes by. Um, again, I think now that uh, now that I've made that slight change to the uh, to to the to the rotation of the shot, uh, I'm just going to come back into global and just go to the end frame. Yeah, I think that that's okay. Um, then I would write out this sequence. So that would just be a straightforward write node from the uh, from from the merge, and then appro approach this in exactly the way that you know how to approach it from previous tutorials. And again, you're going to be rendering the full 250 frames of the of the sequence. So, hopefully, if you've been following, then you've got a nice 3D space scene. But more importantly. Hopefully you've got a familiarity now with the most commonly used 3D nodes. From this point, feel free to fine tune your scene. For example, you might want to make adjustments to the camera path, to the animations, to the colours that I've used in the lights and the colour corrections themselves, or the actual attenuation of the lights uh, as they've been set up. There's a multitude of things that you can do, uh, and that's really down to your own sort of aesthetic. Okay, so that's the end of the tutorial. I really do hope you found it useful and that you'll feel able to apply this and apply these techniques to other projects in the future.